Right, so um, Mike Colt, author of the Armored Saint, the Shadow Ops trilogy, the Reawakening trilogy, and nonfiction, which is so cool that you also do a whole bunch of historical nonfiction. I love that. Um, ranging from counterterrorism to ancient history, uh, premier badass on the TV show uh, Hunted, and wielder mm -hmm. of a amazing beard. It's good to see. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for sitting down with me for a beer, mate. I appreciate it. For having me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. So, um, first cab off the rank for our um, our beer fans. What have you What have you got for yourself? Oh, hold on. I'll be right back. I gotta grab it. <laughs> All oh, right. Bourbon. <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's American for beer. <laughs> it's, Boston, it's Australian for beer. Well, bourbon is American for beer. Cheers, mate. Uh, I've, cheers, mate. <laughs> and like a good, like a good uh, Brooklyn apartment dwelling writer, I drink directly from the bottle. Yeah. This is Woodford Herb Select, which is a fine bourbon. And the thing I love about it is it's not going to break break the bank. It's super, super sweet. It's available at any pub, bar, we call them here. In the United States, you're not going to have any trouble finding it. And it's and it's, uh, it's the people's bourbon, Adrian, if, if something could, could be said. The people's bourbon. Is that the, the people you, just for that area or like you're a big country? That's true. Well, I know I would say that Woodford is like it's about as um, omnipresent as Heineken. You could go to Florida or Texas or Maine, and you're going to find Woodford in the, in the bars there. Yeah. What are you drinking? Um, I'm drinking one of my favorite beers called White Rabbit. Mm. And they, uh, this particular one is a new run that they've just done. They usually do kind of like a dark ale that's probably one of the best beers um, out there that's affordable because our, our craft beer industry here, you know, you're paying $30 for a six-pack sort of thing. You know, it's it's pretty wow. empty. Um, and this well, Sorry? Because everything has to be imported, right? I mean, in um, Ireland. No, no, we've got our, our own breweries. Just the, the cost of living here, especially for things that are fun, like alcohol, is just exorbitant. Well, that's fantastic. I'm against fun. I, I, Australia sounds wonderful. We, uh, we do have a habit of uh, policing the fun quite heavily, especially in New South Wales and Sydney, where I live. Man, this is, this is the kind of place I could make a home. This is wonderful. You've got to get out here, mate. You'll love it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Um, okay, so Shadow Ops is, is where I first got hooked on um, your your writing skill, your writing ability style, I guess is the right word for it. Um, you know, I, I picked it up and um, I smashed for you a bunch of them where I, when I was um, traveling Europe a while back and I had plenty of time on trains and planes and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, it creates like a, oh, it sort of has like this really flowing, wonderful, like fast, nonstop sort of paced action um, style. And you've carried that across from, you know, those sort of mili those, uh, military fiction books in, in Shadow Ops and the Reawakening trilogy where, you know, that sort of writing, I think, is what you have. If you don't have that, you know, your books, are, they tend to be a bit, you know, not as enjoyable as military fiction. But in fantasy, there's such a range of, you know, slower build and, you know, faster books. And, you know, you've got so many different types of, of writing. Um, how, how's your... You know, do you think your writing um, style has, has transferred across to fantasy really easily? Did you think about changing it up or just stick with what you know and go for it? No, I don't know if this is in like the body of interviews that are out there about me, but that is absolutely, I'm really glad that you noticed that clip style. and I'm really glad that you brought it up because it's by design. It's a conscious choice. And I learned it from Peter V. Brett. Um, Peter V. Brett as a, uh, He's an amazing writer. His Demon Cycle series starts with The Warded Man. It may be called The Painted Man over there in Australia when you yeah. buy it at Dimmicks. Yeah, um, but he and I have been best friends since high, late high school, early college, and we are still... In fact, when I finish this interview, I'm going to go over to his house to play with his kids. Um, when we were both starting out as writers, we were both attempting to court Joshua Bilmes, who's a very famous agent here in New York City, represents Brandon Sanderson, represents Charlene Harris. We wanted him to represent us. And um, Joshua took Pete out to lunch because he saw potential in an early draft of The Painted Man, The Warded Man. Uh, he rejected the manuscript, but he said, rewrite it. And he gave him a copy of Scott Meredith's Writing to Sell. 
which was a book. Scott Meredith was Joshua Vilmos' boss when Joshua Vilmos was starting out as an agent. And in that book, Pete learned a prose style that wastes no words. Um, it's the opposite advice. It's the opposite of the prose style of like a Tolkien or a China Mieville, where this is not to bash China Mieville. I love China Mieville's writing. I'm a massive China Mieville fan. Um, but China Mieville is one of the few people who can get away with these long bouts of exposition and really detailed descriptions of things that aren't necessarily relevant to the plot or the character. That's not the writing to sell way. The writing to sell way is all mules haul wood. Every single word must advance plot or character, period. And you savage your manuscripts and cut tens of thousands of words, and it creates this really evocative, clipped prose style. That doesn't mean that you can't have poetic prose and fantastic prose, but um, it keeps the story clicking along. And that is the style that I really love. And that's the style that Pete mastered before me. Um, and uh, his career took off uh, about I don't know, two or three years before mine. So I really learned at Pete's feet. Pete, I think, learned at Scott Meredith's feet. I mean, Scott Meredith was already passed away by the time Pete read that book and started taking those lessons to heart. But um, I really feel that that's responsible for the style that you're recognizing here, both in my military fiction and into my fantasy. And as you know, that, that uh, well, they're both fantasies, but you get the idea. As you know, Pete's Painted Man, if you've read it, is epic fantasy. It's Brandon Sanderson-sized, doorstop, giant, encyclopedia-thick epic fantasy. And I challenge any reader um, of Pete's work to find wasted words. You're not going to. Pete's prose style is every bit as rock and fast as my own. And um, it's by design, and I absolutely learned it from him. Okay. And so from the perspective of, you know, Pete um, knocking out a, a doorstopper, and um, yourself choosing to go with the, the Tor.com uh, novella uh, range, uh, range. So what, what kind of made that, that decision, um, what, what's behind that sort of thinking as opposed to going, right, I want to do a full book? Oh, no, no, there's no thinking at all, in fact. Um, what, went, what went behind it was a desire to sell the story. Um, I made no secret in other interviews that I could not sell The Fractured Girl, which was the book that became The Armored Saint. Uh, that was 110,000 words. And I hammered at that thing and rewrote it for three years. And it was so bad that um, Joshua refused to take it out to market. He was not confident in the manuscript. And it took Justin Landon, who had started out uh, as a blogger and book reviewer. He had a, a website called Staffer's Musings. Um, and he was such an effective book reviewer that his reputation um, got him sort of uh, currency with the editorial crowd in New York City Publishing, and he was hired as a consulting editor to tour. And uh, he had been beta reading The Fractured Girl, uh, and when I couldn't sell it, and after three years, um, I was really ready to give up on it. Uh, and he emailed me and said, look, Mike, I really like this book and I believe in it. Can you cut it down to a novella? Because uh, if you can, and we can make it work, you know, I'll see if Tor, Tor can pick it up for the new Tor.com line. And uh, I did it, and it worked, and, uh, and, it, and it sold as a three-book series. So the decision about the length had nothing to do with me wanting to write a novella. It had to do with that was the market where I was able to sell this, this work that I had been throwing myself against for so long and had been un unable to make it good. Yeah, was it, was it as, um, and what I'm about to say is going to come out quite wrong. I recognize that in advance, but was it as simple as, chopping it up into three different sections or did you take the fractured girl bring it back to 40k or whatever the you know whatever the word count is it? and then 60k oh, 60k and then go okay i've got that i've compressed 110k into 60k and now i'm going to come up with the two sequels that are on the way or is it kind of like a, a split and then a reuse or how, how did you approach that it's the first it's the first of, of that i did not Rewrite. Remember, when I rewrote The Fractured Girl into the, the and, I, and we're calling it a novella, but the truth is 60,000 words is way long for a novella. It's really a short novel. Um, when I rewrote it to that length, again, I didn't know I was going to be able to sell it, right? I could have rewritten it to that length and turned it into Justin, and Justin could have been like, I'm sorry, it's still not good enough, and that's the end of that. So I had no plans for a trilogy. Um, but, I mean, I'm flattering myself here. Please don't 
take this as egotistical, but like I nailed it. Right. And, at, and when I finally gave him that manuscript, everyone was like, wow, this is really good. Can you make it? A, you know, obviously I realized the door was open to sell a trilogy as opposed to a single book. And at that point I, I plotted out the next two books. Um, in fact, Queen of Crows, which is done. And I just turned in the copy edits is somewhere around 74 to 76,000 words. So it's about 16,000 words longer. Um, and it's definitely, I mean, Calling that a novella is charitable. It's you know it's it's basically a short novel. Yeah. Um, the Killing Light, which I'm working on now, I'm, that's at twelve thousand words, and I'll be hacking away at that more this weekend. But no, that that was not the original plan. And and the thing that's I want to say that it's so incredibly satisfying to me um, because you got to understand that for me, um, for I had done six military fantasy books, and I really felt that I had pigeonholed myself as a writer of military fiction because I had an authentic military background. You know, I think the only other uniformed service member who was writing in the genre at the time is Brad Torgerson. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was often praised for my authenticity. And you start to get really insecure about that. I think, are people buying my books because they're good or are people buying my books because they're authentic? And um, I really needed to prove to myself that it was because I could really write outside the genre and do something do something different and do it well. And it, and then of course the three years of being unable to sell the book really started to make me doubt my ability to move outside the ghetto of military fantasy that I had built for myself. And, uh, when I finally got it over the hump and got it over the hump with so much success that I was able to turn it into a trilogy and, uh, both Lee Harris and Justin Landon, uh, Justin no longer is with tour, but Lee Harris is my, current editor uh, at tour both of them think it's better than the fractured girl which is just such an enormously gratifying thing to uh, not the fractured girl i'm sorry the armored saint it's been retitled um that's incredibly gratifying to me because it it, it means that i i did it I, you know i i broke out of that that pen so when it comes to uh the you know novellas at the moment i've i gotta admit it, like i hadn't really given many novellas a go outside of anthologies and then I went a bit crazy on the tour.com website and had one of those days where you sort of go, I'm just going to get that one. Oh, but what about, maybe I'll get that one too. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, 10 new books sitting on your Kindle to, uh, to get through. And, um, what I was kind of thinking, I was, I saw a, I think I read an interview with Mark Lawrence a while back. I believe it was Mark Lawrence. And he was talking about, you know, how it's, it's kind of odd that, um, with our lives having less and less free time in it, you know, thinking that short fiction and novellas should be becoming more popular than, you know, your George Martin doorstoppers and, and these, these huge tomes. Um, but he was saying it seems to be one of the few things that people um, aren't really keen to, to compromise on is the, the length of a book. How, how do you see um, sort of novellas fitting into our, you know, our current reading lives and, and how's, you know, Tor.com's kind of um, uh, sort of publishing plans for you? Have they panned out pretty well so far? Do you think that they'll grow in the future, or how, how do you see that? So it's one of the reasons I'm super excited to be with Tor.com, and unfortunately, I just turned down an opportunity to be with Serial Box, which is a serialized fiction provider, not because I didn't want to do it, I really want to do it, but because I just have too many books under contract right now, I'm too busy, but I hope to work with them in the future. What I love about Tor.com and Serial Box is that publishing is in trouble right now. Publishing is... You know, between ebook uh, issues, between um, uh, online piracy, between um, really bad decisions on, on brick and mortar, uh, brick and mortar booksellers. You know, we, the demise of, of Borders, Barnes and Noble has been holding on by the skin of their teeth. Um, you know, publishing needs to adapt; they need to change. And Tor.com and Serial Box, it's still too early to tell if venues like these are going to be successful long term or not, but they're doing something innovative. They are challenging the existing conservative and sclerotic model of publishing. Um, well, I don't even want to say challenging it, they're expanding it, right? Um, Tor.com is, is a, uh, a wing of Tor. They're helping Tor move into the future and do something different. I know that Tor.com is doing well um, right out of the bat. They've had tremendous success. Dan Polanski's The Builders, Sean and McGuire's books, Every Heart a Doorway and Beneath the Sugar Sky. Um, uh, the, the Armored Saint I know has been selling really, really well. Um, and I know it's, uh, I certainly know it's making uh, tour money, which makes me happy because I want to see publishers succeed. I would say that it's still too early to tell. I agree with um, Mark that a lot of people feel that 
paying a lot of money and getting less book for it. Uh, I, that's one of the common complaints that people have been making about The Armored Saint. It's not any problem with the story, but they feel that they're paying a lot of money and having less pages to read. Um, I really don't know how to address that, uh, you know, for the, for the reader. Um, publishers have to, publishers invest money in books and have to, and have to be businesses that can make a profit. Otherwise, they're not going to be incentivized to publish writers. And certainly enough people have been willing to spend money on the book. Um, uh, so I think it's too early to tell, but I do feel um, really excited to be part of being on the cutting edge of what changes publishing and giving those, those length books time to catch on and gain social currency and acceptance and maybe change the way people think about what they read. Um, I also, in addition to Tor.com, I definitely want readers to be, to be watching Serial Box. And I also want readers to be thinking, I mean, if you think about the popularity of serialized podcasts, which are often, you know, things like the Black Tapes, um, things like Tannis, things like um, not, uh, not just comedy podcasts, but actually chapter fiction, right? The Black Tapes is basically a book in, on audio that's being relayed to listeners one week at a time. Um, and I do think that that is helping to train readers to go back to consuming fiction in a serialized format, which, if you remember, for much of science fiction, fantasy, and horror's early history in the 30s and 40s, magazines like Weird Tales, The Heyday of Analog, um, serialized was the way people consumed their stuff. So uh, I think there's room for that, and we'll see. Yeah, I'm, I've kind of been hoping that the, you know, the, the Netflix approach to uh, storytelling visually would translate into... Um, you know, translate into fiction because you know there is that. You know, when you look at people when they go, okay, um, you know, here's novel one, and then let's talk for six months to a year until novel two comes out. Whereas when you look at, um, you know, when you look at say a Netflix series or um, what we call Foxtel, I know one of the cable stations over there where they just release it on a on a weekly basis, it creates so much more conversation and so much more engagement to have that. That what little one week break between your hour of consumption where you go, okay, let's talk about this. Let's have you know, conversations as fans. Let's have crazy arguments and you know, rage quit Facebook and stuff. But I just think that you know, that's that's kind of exciting for you know, for fiction to see Serial Box still doing so well. I mean, I think I first saw them come out a year or two ago, and you know, they had um, you know, one or two authors going, and, and hopefully they keep growing and they can create something like you said, cutting edge and, and different. Yeah, and I think that they're already doing it. I know they just secured over a million dollars in capital, venture capital funding, um, and I don't think investors are giving that, putting that kind of money behind the medium because they think it's going to fail. Yeah, I really don't. The other cool thing about what you're describing is, um, you know, I work in uh, in uh, law enforcement for a large metropolitan police department that I'm not allowed to tell you is the NYPD, and um, I remember. Um, and I've been in ready room environments like that my whole life in the military and the intelligence services and the Coast Guard. Um, and you hear a lot of water cooler conversation that usually surrounds sports. People come in on Monday and they talk about the game they saw Sunday, right? And what's so cool is when you deal with serialized fiction, you know, obviously not so much in um, uh, print yet, yet, uh, but in television and in podcasts, you hear that water cooler conversation about the last episode of Game of Thrones. Um, people are standing around excited to have a conversation about genre fiction um, that they saw on TV last night, you know, as opposed to the football game. And that's really cool for me to see. And that's new. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll see the same thing here. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with, with you on that one. And um, I think it's always hilarious when, you know, you have that one person that comes into the office on Monday morning. They haven't watched the episode and they're just like, no, don't, talk. Talk. don't talk about it. <laughs> Um, all right, so our the our bloke that reviewed um, the Armored Saint, uh, Mike Myers, is a much smarter guy than I. That, so don't attribute this next question uh, to myself. Um, but he's Mike. You have to excuse me. My cat is attacking something. It's making a bunch of noise. Give me one second. I'm sorry. Mike. Oh, I'm a cat owner too. So. Yeah, All right, sorry about that. It was going to be no a box there, and she was having a crack at it. Um, all right, so we'll, I'll edit that bit out, um, <laughs> and I'll just re-ask the question if that's okay with you. Um, okay. 
Okay, so our, our reviewer, Mike Myers, uh, was our team member that reviewed the Armoured Saint. He, um, he loved it, obviously. It was, it was right up our alley. Um, and he put, uh, he put forward one of the following points in his review. Um, you know, like I said before, he's a much smarter bloke than I am, so attribute this question to him. Um, he said, he asked, uh, he feels that there was a theme throughout the book that questions what right do authorities have to govern people in extremely dangerous situations, something that is compelling based on the expanding role of the government in uh, the current war on terror. Now, what I was, what I was wondering is, like, as Australia, I feel, is, is a fair bit less politically charged at the moment um, than, than the US is. And I'm wondering, is, is that something that, based on your, your military career, you know, what I've seen written from you in, in your you know, Twitter feed and, and Facebook feed, is that something that you purposely look to put through the book? Or are we currently in a climate where, no matter what a creative puts out, um, people are always going to read the current political climate into that, into that work? Right. Right. So this is actually something I talked about on my big idea post for John Scalzi about the book. No, um, when I wrote the book, it was pre-Trump. Um, and I did not, none of us believe that Trump would come to power. None of us believe that the United States, that our institutions would be so brittle and that um, the Republican Party would be so um, dishonorable and duplicitous and just plain, you know, plain, plain evil and willing to do anything to hang on to power. Um, so... I didn't start intend to write it that way, but if obviously, as I was writing it and this stuff came to pass, it made its way into the book, right? Um, and now I'm kind of glad uh, that the book is a commentary about it. It intended to be timely, but it is. You have to remember that, um, you know, I've spent my entire life either in the military or intelligence services or in law enforcement, and I really bought the concepts that come along with that duty on our country. Like they were on sale. I believe that um, you know we do it because uh, you know our our leaders are good and our national ideals are good and because people are good and that um, you know we risk ourselves uh, for the greater good. And now I feel like a chump. I feel like a sucker. Like I've been taken advantage of. And I realize now that the you know the people who have been sending me off sent me off to Iraq you know, did so to profit off of my back and um, that they don't care. And we, we see they don't care. I mean, they, they don't care about law. They don't care about um, justice. They don't care about what's right. Um, you know, you have an evangelist community in the United States that has embraced the president who paid $130,000 to a woman uh, uh, who he cheated on his wife with. Um, and that's just fine. All of those ideals about right and wrong, um, have, they just never meant anything to anyone. Um, but I bought them like they were on sale. And um, that's hard for me because um, I took a lot of personal risks and made a lot of personal sacrifice and lost a lot. And worse, I took a lot away from other people because I believed in those things. Um, and reckoning with that, um, uh, is hard and frustrating. And also, my entire life, when I have been faced with a problem that where the where the, the different where the right and wrong of it are so stark and obvious, what's good and what's evil, what do you do? You pick up a weapon and you go fight the bad guys. You know, but what am I supposed to do now? Pick up a weapon and fight my own government? I can't do that, right? Not only because not because it would be wrong, but because I would lose. You know, I would <laughs> be the most ineffective thing in the world. And I still am in service and I still look around and see, and I'm still part of this community, right? Soldiers, intelligence officers, law enforcement officers who now serve this illegitimate and criminal regime. Um, and uh, the thing that kills me about it and that I realize is the parallel in the book is that um, every molecule in my body tells me I must resist, right? I must fight these people but the fact remains is that these people are still protecting me and protecting others right and still just doing their jobs and still saving lives and all of those things and um that message is fundamental to the armored saint um and to the and to Helwaz's own conflict is that just because this draconian sick religious order 
these horrible things, it doesn't mean they're wrong about everything. And it doesn't mean they don't have a role to play in, in protecting people. And um, I think that that message was always part of the story, but it's taken on special resonance to me now. Okay. And um, when I was listening to um, one of the things that inspired me to reach out to you for an interview was um, listening to the Grim Tidings podcast interview they did with you a, a month or two back. Um, and one of the things I was really interested to hear was that you, you are quite a, a Grimdark fan. And what when it comes to, to Grimdark, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, because of social media and because of people, you know, in the military being able to talk and being able to get their thoughts out there and, and there being less of a filter um, between those people who are in those situations and the rest of us as a community who could not, re not really ever possibly understand what military service people go through. Um, do you think that you know our our fiction is leaning into a more sort of grim and dark sort of way because we've got access to people like yourself, you know, that we didn't previously have before, and you know we have access to, um, you know, a, a lot more access to hearing about people calling out governments for doing dodgy things, and and you know, and those kinds of things. We go, okay, our society is going that way, or is feeling that way. Therefore, our fiction goes that way, or, or do you think? You know, at some point, someone's going to have to go, right, fantasy's got to go. I think someone coined the term noble bright because we need to, you know, we need to offset all the grim and dark in our real lives with something opposite. Well, I mean, um, look, I get it. And I think everybody comes to art looking for something different. Um, I am a literary progressivist. I believe that art, like technology, improves over time and that you will generally find... I generally believe that people writing today write better than people in in the past, um, and that is my firmly held belief. So I do feel that the grim, dark tendency we're seeing in fantasy is a part of a progression, a, a, a legitimate and logical. Look, it's one thing to, for me at least, to escape with fantasy and to have this experience of being transported outside my world, but when Art really resonates with me, especially fantasy. It's when it extrapolates my world, when it feels realistic to me. Because when it doesn't feel realistic, it's like looking at a beautiful painting that's outside myself. Um, a, a perfect example, um, someone once asked me if I, uh, there's always a, a, a game you get, you know, someone will say, well, who do you think the most beautiful celebrity is? The, the woman who you would want to marry, you know, uh, out of all the celebrities. And I always say, none of them. I don't find any celebrities attractive. And the reason I don't find them attractive is they don't seem real to me, right? They seem so uh, outside the realm of, of my experience and of my life. I could never imagine talking to them. I could never imagine meeting them. You know what I mean? Like they, they seem like they're from another world. And so therefore I can't find them attractive because it's not real. Um, and it's the same thing with fiction. When I feel that the story is beautiful and interesting and cool, but so unrealistic and so outside the realm of my experience. I could never imagine it happening and I could never imagine myself in it. Whereas with the Grimdark movement, it feels just as awful as my real life. It feels just as awful as the real world I live in. And then when something redemptive comes of it, when something good is pulled out of it, when the character changes for the better, then that makes me feel like it's possible in my own world too. And that's a much more profound experience for me than, you know, Frodo Baggins, uh, you know, um, excessive earnestness, you know, whatever his problem is. But, um, but that's, I view that as progress. Yeah. Um, but I also want to say that there's, I do think that there's room for everything. And if somebody, if a noble bright movement uh, is, is underway right now, then uh, I hope some great fiction comes out of it. Um, I'd love to see what, what people do. I'm just, uh, I'm just saying what works for me. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, hopefully there'll be a, a Noble Bright magazine or something that I can have a bit of a chin wag. Right. I think that'd be a good chat. But um, right. interesting, like when I remember when I went and saw um, you know, Lord of the Rings, at the, I'd, I'd read the books about 10 or 15 times by the time the movies came out. But um, something really interesting that I thought about is when you look at the author's background, a lot of the stuff he developed for Lord of the Rings was done in the trenches of World War One. And oh, yeah. Yeah, there's this really famous quote, because I remember my friend saying, um, I, I grew up in an area that was quite homophobic. And so I remember sitting in the, 
the cinema and people calling out, you know, oh, it's all the brotherhood and the friendship stuff, you know, they're gay, gay. And I'm just sitting there going, oh, Jesus, guys. And so, like, off. but the interesting, I remember a really famous quote from Tolkien where he was saying, I think he said, by the summer of 1915, all of my friends were dead. And I think, like, when you, when I read, reread Lord of the Rings for the, you know, the 16th or 17th time at that point, it, it just took on so much more, I don't know, like, so much more, um, like emphasis on that friendship it made sense you know so I've, like it's it's quite yeah i don't know a really really big fan of lot of the rings but yeah well worth i think yeah whenever you read it looking at it from that that perspective um okay so geez i've, I've burned through my questions here really well thanks for having a good chat mark <laughs> cheers mate um sure the uh so when it comes to again when it came to the grim tidings podcast um, one of the other really interesting things that uh, you said is that um, you're looking at or you're trying to negotiate a deal with the Black Library. Now, for me, you know, the Black Library is punching out some of the most just just purely enjoyable um, military science fiction on the planet at the moment. You know, the Horus Heresy series, it's, yep. it's a couple of million pages at the moment or something, but it is just... Yep really fun and then the gaunt's ghost series is kind of like you know band of brothers in a science fiction world you know it's just, eisenhorn yeah, eisenhorn that too um you know so i'm just wondering you know what what can you say about um what you're working on with them and if you can't say anything um no i can yeah. no problem with it i hope i look i love i make no secret that i love um the Warhammer 40k universe. It's such a brilliant creation and it only gets better and it only gets stronger. And um, GDW and Black Library have done such an amazing job with it. Um, but, uh, and so I was approached by, I don't know if you're still working there, this guy Graham Lyons, um, who asked me if I wanted to do work. Um, and we, it took me about a year, if you can believe that, of just bouncing back and forth with him until I found the right thing and stuff. And they were going to give me two. One Imperial, Cadian Imperial Guard unit and one Space Marine chapter that didn't have fiction written around them was the Cadian Lucky Sevens and the Marines Exemplar, and they were going to be mine, and I was going to develop them. I was so excited. But unfortunately, Black Library has contract terms um, that, um, you know, I just can't accept. Um, and uh, that's, that's, and that is not a moral failing or a business failing on the part of Black Library. You have, people seem to forget that publishing is business. It's a business. And publishers have a right to profit from their business, and they have a right to set contract terms that are advantageous to them. That's how business works. It's how all business works. And there's nothing shady or incorrect in, in trying to strike a deal that's advantageous for yourself in a business. Um, and lots of authors are perfectly fine with Black Library's contract terms. At, you know, great authors like Dan Abton, you know, like Mike Lee, you know, like big, great writers are t totally fine with those contract terms and are able to produce great fiction in Black Library. I am not fine with those contract terms, but that is my business choice. Um, and I have no ill will toward Black Library. And I was actually approached by their new acquisitions editor um, about oh, six, six months ago now or something, maybe even less, asking me, hey, you know, would you consider it again? And we looked at the contract again, and it's still, the, the issues that I have have still not changed. Um, so I'm gutted. I am devastated. I would love to write for Black Library. I have tons of ideas. Um, I could start spitting out Warhammer 40K books tomorrow uh, if I had a shot. Um, but, you know, this is, writing for me is not a hobby. It's my business. And uh, I have to, uh, I have to be happy with my contract terms or I can't work with the business. So. Fair enough. So yeah, what are you going to Yeah, what are you going to do? And and you're right, you know, it is like I I work in bids management for a living and you're right, you know, you you lay down your contract terms, you get the other, you know, business person's contract terms and if you can't find a middle ground, that's that's just life really, isn't it sometimes? That's just like thing. Nobody nobody has deceived anybody. Nobody has, you know, tried to tra it's just they negotiated in perfectly good faith and they tried to negotiate it to their other authors, but happens not to be to me. Oh well. Fair enough. So are, are the Cadians um, like a, a favorite faction of yours? Or of course, I mean, I mean well, Cadia, like um, my, one of my favorite. Dan Abner is really the only guy I think who's captured the spirit of Cadia for me in the third um, Eisenhorn book, Hereticus. I don't know if you've read it, where Gregor visits Cadia. Because you have to remember that Cadia is the closest world to the Eye of Terror, so that right whenever there's a chaos incursion, 
Katie is right there, yeah. right? Katie gets hit. So growing up Katian is a very, very, very different life than if you're growing up like in that somewhere else in the Helicon subsector. Um, because, you know, from the moment you come out of your mother's womb, you have to be ready to fight uh, because you never know when the warp is going to spit something out at you. And um, I just love that culture. Um, and I love the, um, you know, the, their rule for burial in Cadia, which is that um, because so many people die that um, because of the constant fighting that there's just not enough places to bury everyone. So um, you are allowed a grave as long as your hand chiseled headstone lettering holds up against the wind and weather. And once it's no longer legible, your bones are exhumed to make room for someone else. That kind of world building is what makes uh, the Warhammer 40,000 world so amazing. And one of the things that makes Cadian culture such a mainstay because, and I love the fact that it's, it's a low port portion of the universe. We always hear about the Adeptus Astartes. We always hear about the Space Marines. That's the genesis of the Warhammer world, former 40k world. But um, even the writers and designers in that universe are hip to the fact that those are the nobles of that universe. Those are the knights. Those are the few. Um, the many are the Imperial Guard, right? You know, the Gungeonet Rifles and, you know, these hundreds of thousands of nameless, you know, young men and women that are just being thrown into the grinder to keep the Imperium of Man, Imperium of, Imperium of Man safe. Yeah, and I think that's that's why when I mentioned earlier that the um, you know the Gaunt's Ghost series is probably probably actually my, my favorite 40k series is because it tell it tells that story of the you know the average Joe who's given a las rifle and just you know go that way. We're probably not going to bother you giving you rations because chances are you'll be dead tomorrow. You know it's and that's yep. that. I don't know it. it I think to me that, you know, there's, there's probably what, there's probably billions of those soldiers. And to me, there's billions of those stories, you know, that, that are like, um, geez, I'm trying to remember some of the names, you know, that are like that Elijah Koo fellow that, um, for, if you remember from the Gaunt's ghosts, you know, he's that, that sick, you know, just a horrible maniac, but that, you know, is still part of their crew and is still, you know, part of this diminishing group that are, you know, the, the final guys from the Tanith first and only, you know, so like, uh, you know, I'm I'm with you on that one. The Imperial Guard have always been yeah. been a massive favourite of mine. <clears throat> um, on let's go back to uh, Queen of Crows. So mm -hmm. uh, Queen of Crows is dropping when in Australia, the US, and UK. Yes, in October sixteenth. October sixteenth, fantastic. Um, will you be doing any appearances, blog tours, signings, places to get a selfie, or anything like that with you? Oh uh, wow! Um, so I try to keep blogging guest blogging to a, you know, the, the idea of a blog tour, which is, I, I, I always try to call it by its more realistic name, which is doing what I do for money for free. <laughs> um, so uh, I will do blog posts um, for blogs that I really, on my own terms for free, that I really feel have a, have a um, that I'm getting something out of it. I'm getting a real reach, hitting a real audience, but no, I don't do blog tours. For appearances, um, unfortunately, nothing outside the United States. I'm going to do, my next will be Phoenix Comic Fest in, uh, was formerly Phoenix Comic Con in Phoenix, Arizona in May. I'll be doing Dragon Con in September. I hope to be doing New York Comic Con in October. But other than that, no real plans. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to be um, more careful about going to cons that, unless I'm being hosted. What, what a lot of people don't know is that most writers, with the exception of very, like New York Times bestsellers, you know, you're usually not getting even your expenses paid when you go to a con. Yeah. Um, or you're having to cover your own airfare, your own hotel. So it can cost, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars for an author to go to a con. And I, I'm trying to, and of course they're a lot of fun, you know, it almost feels like a vacation, but, um, I'm trying to really now stick only to those conventions that are willing to cover my expenses. Um, I'm not getting speaking fees. I'm not being paid to go, but at least, um, I'm not having to fork out money from my own pocket and that's limiting my, my, uh, my run of appearances. Right. Okay. So um, you're going right. If you know, looking for that return on investment to make sure that you're, um, you know, you're not shelling out money hand over fist. Which again, it's you know, this is your business, and that's it's a right. That's thing. exactly right. Now, we'll tell you this. Um, if fans, this is why I'm so active on social media because the truth is, I really don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating about that. I spend most of my time either at work or writing. Yeah. Um. So uh, social media does double duty for me. On the one hand. It allows me to actually feel like I have a social circle and to not be alone, not feel alone. <laughs> but the other thing 
does is it um, it makes me accessible. So if, yeah. if you can't um, catch up to me at a con, you want a book sign, I have these sticker back book plates, which I'll sign. And, and they're, you know, they're just pieces of paper with my signature and the logo. Um, and they're sticker backs. So you put them on the inside cover of your book and then you have an autographed book. And I will send them to anyone who wants one anywhere in the world, my dime. So if you want an autographed book, you just have to email me. And I try to make myself incredibly accessible on social media. So if you can't find catch up to me at a con, you can always email me. You can hit me up on Twitter or Facebook. And I, I think I'm really good about responding. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I think I've chatted to you a couple of times and yeah, you've been, I think before I went to, uh, before I went traveling in Europe, I actually hit you up and asked you what order I should read, um, the shadow ops books in. And then I just went and just bought them all anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you, do you have any plans? Like one of the things that I find is is really popular for Grimdark Magazine fans is is purchasing um, you know special editions or signed first editions. Um, are you looking at um, for the the Armored State and its sequels? Are you looking at any sort of omnibus special editions or, or anything like like that? Right. So um, I did not expect this, but Armored Saint went into a second printing. I think it was out one week before it sold out its yeah. print run and went into printing. So. Um, yes, there are first editions, um, and I, um, I have signed a bunch of them for Tinker's Packs. Tinker's Packs is the online store for Pat Rothfuss's World Builders charity. So not only will you be getting a signed first edition if you buy from the Tinker's Packs, but you will be supporting World Builders, which is a fantastic charity. It's a theater charity for um, Heifer International, which uh, is, the thing I love about that is that Heifer International and World Builders gives sustainable micro gifts to people in developing countries. So instead of, for example, instead of, you know, bringing in a shipload full of rice that a corrupt warlord or government official is going to meet on the docks and steal, you're giving individual farmers, you know, a flock of ducks, um, a single goat, um, instructions on how to make cheese, those kinds of things, which are often, since they're so small, they fly under the radar of the corruption that's endemic in the developing world. So um, I really love that charity because I know that the money is helping the people who need it the most. Um, it's really, really fantastic. Uh, so if you want to sign first edition, Tinker's Packs is the place to go. Um, you can Google it uh, or and you will be uh, supporting world builders. In terms of an omnibus edition, that's really up to tour. Um, it's going to, and I, I tell you right now, it's going to be driven by sales. If sales of all three books are strong enough that tour feels that if they release an omnibus edition, people will buy it, uh, they'll do it. And if they don't, they won't. It's, yeah. it's interesting. This has been a theme, a theme throughout our discussion today is like, it's just business. Yeah. So the podcast is going to, the name of this episode will be, it's just business. Um, but yeah, that's like, that's really what's going to govern it. I think. Yeah, it's um the the reason I find that it's just business sort of approach so interesting is because when when I kicked off our, our little magazine, you know, I, I just threw money at it. I didn't even do accounts for two years, you know. I just just let it happen, and then it wasn't until um, we had this pretty horrible thing happen a while back where one of our distributors folded right after I'd given them about eight thousand dollars that I sat down. Um, this ah, oh, you know, it, again, it's business. It happens, you know. It, it's it's unfortunate, but that's that's life. But then. It wasn't until then that I sat down and actually went through my numbers and just went, oh, shit. That is literally three years profit for a small e-zine, you know? And that's when it's, you know, that's when that sort of just sort of dropped in and all of a sudden when people would say, you know, oh, can you do this? Can you review that? Can you do all these things? I'd start looking at everything with, am I going to get a return on investment with this? And, you know, it, it kind of... Your, your, the story you're telling me is exactly what my writing career was like. When I first started, when I first got my book deal and people were coming around, will you come to this convention? Will you, will you do this interview? Will you write for my blog? My answer was yes, 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 yes. And it took four years, I think, five years before I started thinking, um, you know, this is a job. Um, and, uh, you know, I would like some time to, you know, live my life and, and see the people in my life and I would like some money yeah. and uh, you feel guilty about it. You feel really guilty about it. Um, and I think we're conditioned to feel guilty about it. We're conditioned to feel that if we demand recompense for ourselves that we're somehow selfish um, and it's just not the case. And I think um, part of making sure that your career is sustainable and that um, your magazine can continue for many years so that people can enjoy it is paying attention to stuff like that. And the same is true of my writing career. 
yeah, it um it kind of hit home when I you know I sort of looked at our our fan base and stuff and went okay, you know basically I I watched a couple of other small publishers collapse and they had their fan bases who just bought everything they put out and all of a sudden they lost access to their favorite authors to you know their publisher and I looked at it and said okay, it is also kind of a you know a responsibility to myself and and my family to not send myself bankrupt but. At the same time, you have a responsibility to your fans to be, you know, to try and be careful and, and make sure that you can keep doing stuff for as long as they they want to keep reading it. That's right. Um, all right, mate. Well, uh, that's that's everything for me. Thank you um, so much for you know for uh, delaying your trip out to hang out with Peter V. Brett's kids and uh, and for hanging out with me and for opening your bottle of bourbon. <laughs> to no, that's it. great. I love the excuse to drink. It's really cool. I, I think I can't remember the last time I talked to an Australian. That's not true. An Australian who wasn't a cop, um, <laughs> yep. but uh, uh, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the magazine prosper. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you very much.